Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a song out there called Personal Jesus by the, pan, the band uh, Depeche Mode. And I don't know if I'm saying that right. The basic gist of the song is about how someone might look to another person for help and reassurance, almost like they have their own personalized version of Jesus. Here's just a sample of the lyrics. Feeling unknown and you're all alone, flesh and bone by the telephone. Lift up the receiver, I'll make you a believer. Take second best, put me to the test. Things on your chest you need to confess. I will deliver, you know I'm a forgiver. Now if you don't like dance or electronic music, uh, Johnny Cash did a cover of this song that's actually halfway decent. But the lyrics always leave me wondering, why would someone feel the need to write a song called Personal Jesus? Why the need for a personalized version of who Jesus is and what he does? A lot of people have modified the real historical Jesus into their own personal savior. And what I mean by that is there are people who look at the life of Jesus, what he said, what he did, and can pull any of those events out of context and make Jesus into whatever kind of savior they want him to be. They see what they want to see and ignore the stuff that doesn't really fit the picture of Jesus they are trying to craft. And then you end up with a Jesus who supports and backs up your own personal agenda. And the biggest attribute that very often gets ignored is the fact that Jesus is God. 100% man, yeah, but also 100% God. And that leads us into our last tough question that we're going to look at in this series. Did Jesus ever claim to be God? Now, it's true. You could read the Gospels from front to back and you'll never find the verse. And Jesus said, I am God. And I'm going to take a wild guess that everyone watching this sermon believes that Jesus is God. But how do we know that for sure? How can we know, how can we show and people who have changed Jesus in whatever suits their own personal needs who he really is? And who he told us he was. Let's listen to what one of Jesus' best friends has to say about him. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You know, when there's something new and exciting, you have that initial wave of excitement and popularity. Jesus rode one of those waves at the beginning of his ministry. People wanted to to hear him teach things they had never heard before. They wanted to see miracles that no one else could do. But here, that wave had kind of petered out. People were starting to lose interest because Jesus wasn't the kind of savior they all personally wanted. So, he bluntly asked his disciples a question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say I am, now that they've gotten to see me and know me a little? The disciples offered some of the answers that people were were sharing at the water cooler. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In other words, the people all thought that Jesus was a prophet from some time or place who had returned from the dead. Why? Well, they recognized Jesus was from God, but they also had an endless variety of opinions about who he was. And if we throw the same question Jesus asked out there in in, in our world today, you're going to hear a lot of different thoughts and opinions. You'll have some that deny he even existed. They'll say he's just a myth uh, created to reinvigorate a dying religion. And even if someone does believe he was real, a real historical figure, you're still going to hear a bunch of different ideas about who he was, and what he stood for. Someone could point to the way he fed the 5,000 and say, Jesus was all about caring for the poor and needy. Another person could look at the way he reached out to the adulterous woman who was about to be stoned and claim he wanted to change moral codes about sex and relationships. Or look at, look at the Sermon on the Mount. Right? It's all about loving each other. And the list goes on and on. He was a moral teacher or a peaceful protester wrongly put to death. He was the Gandhi of his time, which is weird because Jesus actually came first. And it's not that some of those things aren't true. Some of them are. But they aren't the full picture. There's more. 
But the thing is, you could pull any of the, those stories from Jesus' life or one of his quotes out of context and make Jesus into whatever you want him to be. You could take whatever expectations you have for him, and chances are you could make it a reality with a little slicing and dicing. And the thing is, we're just as guilty as anyone of doing that. We foist our expectations on Jesus that are either not the full picture or are not in line with who he really is and what he came here to accomplish. Think about all the times you've wanted Jesus to be a savior, a curtain of protection from physical sickness. Or you've turned his message about the kingdom of heaven into a political promise about rights and privileges. And what about the times that we want to twist his message of the gospel into something that promises financial prosperity as long as you're walking close enough to him? But there's one more big trap we fall into with this. It's not so much throwing our expectations on the Jesus but taking something away from who he is and, and what he came to do. In verse 16, Peter gives this awesome, confident confession of what he knew about Jesus. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Hit the nail right on the head, wouldn't you say? Jesus even gives him the name Peter, which is Greek for rock, to solidify even more just how awesome his confession was. But listen to what happens not very long after that. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And then he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Peter confesses who he knows Jesus is, the Savior, the true Son of God. And Jesus tells him what that means, the deeper implications of what it meant that God's son was living right next to them. And how did Peter react? No way, Jesus. That's not who you are. At the heart of Peter's backtracking is this fear. Fear that he got it all wrong. Fear that he backed the wrong horse in the race. This isn't the kind of Messiah and Savior he was talking about. And that same fear can capture our hearts too. I think that fear manifests in a different situation though. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But I can think of situations when I didn't let Jesus be who he really is, who he came here to be. When I've been talking with someone that has their own thoughts about God and religion and what happens to people after they die, and instead of telling them more about the way to get a good relationship with the true God, instead of telling them the whole truth about who Jesus is, instead of sharing the hope of eternal life and what it means for life right now, I stop. I don't let Jesus be who he really is. I let fear stop me from letting Jesus be what he came here to be, our only way to the Father. If we circle back to Peter's confession, there's some really neat things that we can unpack. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Do you know the significance of that word Messiah? It's, a, it's the Hebrew equivalent of the word Christ, which is talked about like it's Jesus' last name or something. But both words mean anointed one. Anointing is when they would pour oil over someone's head to mark that they were chosen by God to do something special. Maybe they were supposed to be the next king, prophet, or priest. Whatever their job was, this is how you marked someone special. God promised, though, that there would be a special anointed one. And he would be different than all the rest. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. He would be able to do everything that was, on, that was in God's heart and on his mind because he wouldn't be just any ordinary anointed priest. He would be the anointed one. And that's where the second part of Peter's big confession comes into play. The son of the living God. This special anointed one that God's people were waiting for with bated breath is God's own son. When Jesus was baptized, God's own voice thundered down from heaven and made sure that fact was clear as day. Peter had seen and heard it all. He heard the message of God's kingdom come and the new command to love God and love your neighbor. He saw his teacher do awesome things, things that only God could do, even raising people from the dead. He had all the evidence he needed to reach his conclusion, this is God's son, and therefore, true God. 
And Jesus' reaction to Peter's confession is really telling. If it was off base or just flat out wrong, Jesus would have set him on the right course. But he doesn't realign Peter. He validates and praises his answer. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus praises Peter's answer because it isn't something that he simply came to on his own. Yeah, he saw a lot of the evidence, but so did a lot of other people who had no clue who Jesus really was. God the Father led Peter to this conclusion and led him to make his confession. And Jesus promised to build his church on this very rock-solid confession. And Peter's name now would mean rock. And a rock is the perfect picture for this. When we confess our faith in Jesus as the Christ, the promised Son of God, our Savior, we're taking a stand. We're standing on him as the one who not only can but will protect us to eternal life. And when someone takes their bold stand on God, confessing that they really know who he is, we can see it clear as day. So what does all this mean for us? Even if we can show someone Jesus is God, why does that matter so much? For that, I would point you to the promises he makes to Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If I told you that you could lay siege to sin, death, and the devil and come out on top and back that up with my word as a promise, wouldn't really mean much. Coming from me, just a regular Joe Schmo, that promise doesn't pack much punch. But coming from Jesus, it means so much more. Because if Jesus is true God, then that means what he says will happen can and will happen. When he says that the church built on Peter's confession of faith won't be overtaken, we know that's a promise from our God. When he says that he will be with us always until the very end of, your, end of the age, that's your God making that promise. And when he says it is finished, we can see that's our God and our Messiah giving up his life for ours. We could take him at his word because that's God speaking. And in his grace, Jesus gives us the authority to do something really important. Talk about God's forgiveness. Imagine for a second, your dad had a, a 67 Ford Mustang that he treated like another child. I mean, he babied this thing. Are you just going to take the keys one day and, and take her for a spin? Not if you value your life. Now, what if mom tries to throw the keys at you? You're probably still going to hesitate because you might wonder if she really has the right and authority to do that. So when Jesus throws us the keys of forgiveness, something important and valuable, well, what gives him the right? If he's not true God, then he has no right, but he is. And that gives him the authority to give us this powerful key. He proclaims that in him our sins are forgiven, and this key is so powerful that even the gates of hell itself cannot stand up against it. Think about it. We might feel in this increasingly godless world like we're under attack from the devil, from unbelief, from hell itself, like we should take shelter from a storm. But Jesus points out that standing on him armed with his powerful keys, it's we who are storming to take down hell itself, to rescue those who still don't know Christ, to proclaim to people the good news that there is a rock in Jesus. Maybe Jesus never flat out says, I am God anywhere in the Bible. But we stand right there next to Peter and give the same confident confession he gave. Led by the Holy Spirit, we can say he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who makes and keeps his promises and has the authority to leave us with awesome tools to show others that he is who he claimed to be. Amen. And now, this peace of God that goes beyond all understanding, it will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.